we're going to talk about doubting clauses this week. And this first bit will be familiar because it's about indirect statements. Now, the verb dubitare, when not accompanied by a negative, which means non, is usually followed by an infinitive of indirect statement. So remember that the subject of the indirect statement is always in the accusative case, even though it takes the role of the nominative. And an indirect statement will be introduced by a head verb. Remember to think, to think, to see, to hear, to doubt, to know. Those are head verbs, things that originate in the head. And usually has a that in the English translation. And then finally, the infinitive will not be translated as a to verb. Remember, it's one of the first times we learned about that. It feels weird to translate an infinitive as a regular verb, not as an infinitive, but here in an indirect statement, it's not translated as a direct infinitive. Now, you learned indirect statements at the end of book two, so this really shouldn't be anything new to you. If you need to go back and watch the video on indirect statements again, take a few minutes and then you'll be better prepared to do your homework in class. All right, so let's try this sentence. Dubitatis marcum nostre matram amare. Here we have our infinitive that we're not going to translate as an infinitive. And y'all, dubitatis, y'all doubt. And then here is our indirect statement. So our head verb is doubt. Y'all doubt that, remember, Marcus. And remember, this is in the accusative because it's the subject of the indirect statement. Y'all doubt that Marcus, here's our infinitive, amare, loves, it's in, our, it's in present tense, nostre matrum, our mother. Okay, so this is more of a statement than in question, which means that you'll use the indicative. So if you see amare, right, in the indicative, so it's a statement, not an unsure of, right? This is, I, I believe this to be true. I don't, it's not a wish or a hope for or an uncertain. It's I believe it to be true, which is why we put Amari, the infinitive, right? Exactly like it is in the indicative. Now, here's the new part. Positive doubting clauses. So sometimes the statement really isn't a statement, but a question, even if it's an implied question and not a direct question. We call it a positive doubting clause because there isn't a not included. So that may sound weird, but it's called positive only because there's a not not included. Now, for instance, if I said, I doubt whether you will show up on time. Now, I'm stating my doubt. So, and I do that by the word weather. Now, there isn't a not included, so it's a positive doubting clause, so don't let that confuse you. But the word weather indicates that I'm unsure, and I'm indirectly questioning your ability to be punctual. So if the indirect statement is introduced by the conjunction in Latin, on or num, which both mean weather, the verb will not be in the infinitive form, but in the subjunctive form. So if you remember here, in our indirect statement, it was amare was in the infinitive. So if it's introduced by the conjunction on or num, verb's not in the infinitive, but it's in the subjunctive. So let's take a look at these. So dubitatis on, here we go. Here's the indirect statement. There we go. On Marcus nostri matrum amet. Here we have the subjunctive amet is in the subjunctive. Um, and here's the main phrase, dubitatis, y'all doubt. And then we've got the weather, so I've got an on, which turns into weather. Y'all doubt, so dubitatis on Marcus nostri matrim amet. Y'all doubt whether Marcus loves our mother. Okay, so this is a doubting statement. I'm not sure, there's no non in it. So it's positive, even though I'm really not positive that I it really, even though I'm not positive that this is true or I'm doubtful that what I'm saying, right? So let's look at the next one. Dubito, num arbitua sit. So here we go. Here's a num. This is the whole indirect statement. Num arbiturus sit. So this is the doubting clause. 
Our main, our main clause is dubito, right? It's a whole complete sentence. I doubt. And then here we start with the whether. Whether she will go away. And the arbituracit is in the subjunctive. Okay, last one. Now, sometimes it can be an actual question that uses the verb dubitare. So let's try it in question. Do you doubt? Here we go. Dubitasne. Do you doubt? That's the beginning. And then here is, um, I'm actually going to highlight that here. Here is the doubting clause. Ile weary milites assent. And again, we have it in the subjunctive. Do you doubt? those men were soldiers. And we could put whether those men were soldiers in there and that would make sense. Um, we also don't have to put it in there because it also makes sense in English. So um, that is a positive doubting clause. And the only reason it doesn't, it's a positive doubting clause is there is no known. Okay, so let's take a look at a negative doubting clause. All right, let's talk about negative doubting clauses. Now, I'll give you an example in English. I don't doubt that you'll eat the last avocado. And can you tell what makes it the negative doubting clause? I've got that don't right here. I still have my doubt, but I have a don't doubt, right? Um, we, I don't doubt that you'll eat the last avocado. So it's telling me it's not a double negative. It's not saying that doesn't turn, two negatives don't make a positive, it's not that, but it has this don't or this not in it, where as opposed to the positive doubting clause, it doesn't have a known or a not in it. So if the expression of doubting is negative, it's a gotcha, don't there, the clause is introduced by quin, which means that, and is followed by the subjunctive verb. So let's take a look here. Um, known, here we go. There's a, that shows us in, in both of these that shows us that it's negative. Okay, he did not doubt. Here's the quin non dubitabat. He did not doubt, and then here's our, our doubting clause quin et e crederimus that we believed him. And then here we have crederimus is in the subjunctive. Okay, known as dubium quin, here we've got the quin, graecii fortissimi ascent. Even though it doesn't matter in a lot of Latin what the word order is, what I like is that clauses tend to be introduced by words and to help us that, that are always the same. So that's help us to identify these clauses. So known as dubium quin, graecii fortissimi ascent. So here we have the subjunctive here. There is no doubt. Here's our, here's our negative again. He did not doubt. There is no doubt. And then that. That the Greeks were exceedingly brave. Here we have translating into uh, from the subjunctive into the imperf this imperfect subjunctive there and then into English. So, so here's a question. Quis dubitat quin imperator acidat? So here we have the subjunctive again. Who doubts that? So this is called a virtual negative, which means the negative is implied. So there's no, if you look, there's no known in here, but it's an implied. Who doubts that the emperor approaching? It's going to want the answer. No one doubts is the, that the emperor is approaching. And then when I put it into a statement there instead of a question, you can see how I put the no one, right? It puts the negative in there. Now, because no one really doubts that the emperor, emperor is approaching, but it's just the way that the sentence is put together. So one caveat, the verb dubitari can also mean to hesitate. When the meaning is to hesitate, the infinitive is used. So this holds true for positive or negative doubting clauses and only context which will tell you is the meaning. So if you want to understand that a little bit more, there is some examples of that in the book. So just be aware of that. Does it mean to hesitate or does it mean to doubt? Understand the context of the sentence and that will give you, uh, that will give you a really good idea of to whether you need to use the infinitive or whether you need to use the subjunctive. <music>